Okay, so tonight we're talking about data storage. Up until now, everything we have done on our computers or in our Python programming has been in the local RAM, the, the random access memory. So when the program stops, the data goes away. Anything I've typed in is no longer there. It just vanishes. So what can we do? Well, we can learn about storage outside of the running program, and those are files. Now, everything's a file. The, the program that's running, the, the, the Keynote program right now that's running this is a file. The .py files you put in, you, you submit, are files. PyCharm itself is a file. Microsoft Word is a file, or probably a series of files. So everything is a file. Um, and so we have to learn how to manipulate those. So we've got some, some new keywords and some new concepts. So the keywords really aren't keywords. Well, with is a keyword. But we have some new functions. We have open, close, read. Um, open just tells Python to get a file descriptor. And we'll talk about file descriptors in a minute. Um, Close tells Python to return the file descriptor to the operating system. Read tells us to get all the contents from a file. And with is a keyword that negates the need for close. And I'll show you that trick in a little bit. Um, so what is a file? Uh, I, as I said before, everything on a computer is a file, including the Python interpreter, PyCharm, .py file, Microsoft Word, anything that is on your system is in a file. That's how um, information is stored on any hard drive. And every time you access a file, every time you open a file, every time you run a program, every, every time you type you know, an email, you're, you're creating files. And we need to know how to use those files so we can interact with the operating system. OK, so we're back to doing with CRUD. What can I do with a file? Well, I can create it, I can read it, I can update it, and I can delete it, just like everything else, just like lists, um, strings. You, you create, read, update, delete. So let's talk a little bit about files and operating systems. There are multiple operating systems out there in the world. The big ones are Windows, Linux, and the Mac OS, which is a lot like Linux. And then you have mobile operating systems. You know, you have iOS and you have Android. Those are the big ones. Um, so every operating system handles files differently. If you're talking about um, laptops or desktops, you're talking about Windows, Linux, and Mac. If you're talking about phones, you're talking about iOS or Android. And we all they all handle it differently. iOS does not handle files the same way the Mac operating system does. So how do we write a program when we're trying to in, that we're trying to write where we're going to interact with the operating system, e.g. use files? And, and make it so that it can run on multiple platforms, because that's really what you want. You don't want to write code that's only good for the Mac or that's only good for Windows, even though Microsoft would love for you to believe that. Um, so how do we do that? We, use, we choose languages that take us above the level of needing to act with an operating system. A program like C, programming language like C, you're going to interact with the operating system very, very closely. And to have a C program run on Linux, you would have to, ha and Windows, you would have to have different versions to deal with all the stuff that happens with the operating system. 
if we see languages like Python, Python provides us the ability to use the same Python script um, and access files without worrying about the operating system. It's called write once, read many. And so I only write the program once, but I can run it on, or run many, sorry. I can run it on Windows, and I can run it on Linux, and I can run it on Mac, because Python takes care of stuff for me. So yeah, it's called write once, run many. So a file has property. It has a name, it has a size, and it has a location on disk. You can think of the location on disk as just an address. I have a home address. Most people have a home address. So that, that location on disk is a unique address for that file. The name, the size, the location is all called metadata. And because it's the data about the file. It's not the file itself. And it's contained in a file object, and that file object is provided to us by Python. So all of this is just underlying what's happening in Python and what's happening on your operating system. And I feel like it's important to understand what's happening with an operating system and what's happening with your program and how it interacts with that. So here's my file. I have properties and I have content. The properties for my file, the name is myfirstfile.txt. It's going to be 28 bytes and it's in home L Shannon. That, that's, that's the three things. Now, the contents are separate from the properties. The contents is actually what you see in the file. And in this case, I'm going to have this is a slash M, which is a new line character with a, a file slash line, slash n, new line, with two lines. So that's all. That's the contents. When I want this file, that's what I'm after. It's what's on the inside of that file. But I can't get to it without knowing where it is and what its name is. I don't necessarily have to know the size, especially not for these examples. However, if I were dealing with massively large files, I would want to know the size because I would want to handle that data in chunks so that I'm not flooding my program. So, opening a file. This is the CRU part, but not the D part of CRUD. Before you do anything with a file, you have to open it. Now, opening a file doesn't get you the contents. It gets you the ability to get the contents. So, I have a variable called my file. I know it's a variable. It's on the left-hand side of single equal sign. On the right-hand side of the single equal sign is a function called open. Open will give me back something called a file descriptor. The file descriptor will live in the variable my file, just like any other value would. And it is a way to get to the contents of the file. So what do I have to do with open? Well, I, it's, um, let's see, I have to give it a name, and it may have to be fully qualified. Fully qualified means that you just have to give it the full directory structure. And a mode. The mode can be run of read, write, append, or binary. And it can also be a combination. You can have a mode that's RW. You can read and write the file. You can have a mode that is read and append the file. And append just means add it to the bottom. So that's the components of using the open function to get a file descriptor for the file. So, and I'm going to be saying this a lot tonight. Always remember to close the file descriptor. A file descriptor is a system resource, just like the amount of disk space you have, just like the amount of RAM you have. Operating systems have limited numbers of file descriptors. And for this class, it's not a huge deal, but if you're out there in the programming world, you have to manage your computer resources, which means you have to remember to close your file. 
There's also another reason to close your file, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. But if you have an open, excuse me, you have to have a close. Um, let's see, rule, if a file already exists in location specified, Python will open it. If it does not exist in the location, uh, then Python will create a new file using W or R. So Python will actually create the file for you. Some things won't. Java, you have to check the file exists before you start doing anything. It won't automatically create a file. But Python will do that for you. Um, and always remember to close your file. I think I'm going to say that a lot tonight. How do I read data from a file? So I've got my file descriptor, but how do I get at the contents? So there, when you want to get at the contents, you're going to read the file. There's a bunch of different ways to do it. The easiest way is to read it. So we have the my file variable, and I'm going to use the dot notation to call read. So it's going to say, hey, Python, read the contents of my file. That's how you read the dot notation in this respect. And I'm going to set the outcome of that to my stir. So what basically I'm doing is I'm opening a file. I'm opening the file. So I'm getting the file descriptor. Then I'm telling Python, okay, using this file descriptor, get me all of the data in that file and take all of the data and put it in a variable called my stir. So my stir is going to have this is a file new line in with two lines. And that's what it's going to have. That's what my stir will have in it. And then you just treat it like a string. Once you've read the contents out of the file, it's just a string. And then, of course, we close it. Now, closing the file does not get rid of the contents. Once I have assigned the contents to a variable, they live in a variable just like any other any other thing, just like anything I've typed into my keyboard. They're still there as long as the program is running. So I can get the contents I need and then close the file and still work on whatever data I got from that file. Okay, so there's some other things I can do. I can read files as a list. Um, so I have my file. It's the same file I had before, but instead I'm going to call something called read lines. Now read lines, what it does is it takes a delimiter and we're just not giving it any, so it's going to use the new line. And basically it just reads everything. Every Every individual line will be read as it's its own line. So the last one I got one long string. This one I'm going to get a list at, and the list is going to have two elements. And each of those, the first one is going to be this is a file, and the second one is going to be with two lines. So that's another way to do it um, so that you're not having to do some kind of a split on the string. You can let Python do that when you're reading stuff in, and this becomes very handy in one of your labs this week. And then I'm going to close. Um, always remember to close. So uh, let's go out and take a look at this. Uh, where is it? Read. Let's look at that one for a minute. No, we're not going to do that yet. So this is just the same thing we saw. And I just kind of want to take a look at it for a minute. Now I have manylines.txt right here. This is my file, line one, two, three, and four. Nothing special, just four lines in a file. So when I go to read.py, and I've got my handy dandy breakpoint because we all know I like to debug stuff. So we're just going to walk through this in the debugger for just a second. Okay, seven. And where is it? 
read.py. Okay. So I'm just going to debug this real quick so we can see what's happening. I'm on line one, and I'm going to open many lines.txt. So when I, I'm going to look at my variables. I don't have anything yet. So I'm stepping over. And it, when you see right here, I don't have a name or anything. My file is equal to a text IO wrapper. That is a kind of file descriptor. And then there's all this name equal many lines dot text. It's been open for writing. So if I do not put a mode, it will open it for writing only. That's the default. And then I can get an encoding. And that encoding is very helpful if you're doing foreign language stuff. But we're not going to do that. So now I'm going to read the lines. So let me step over that. And now I have a... Um, I have a list. That list has four things in it, and it has line one with a new line, line two with a new line, line three with a new line, and line four. So I'm just going to print them, and then I'm going to close my file descriptor. So that's just a quick, um, a quick example of how to read a file and using read lines. Read lines is very handy. And we're going to get into, in a little bit, we're going to get into some more sophisticated ways of reading them. So, um, my file is not the contents of a file. It's simply the way to get to it. And I retrieve the contents line by line in a for loop. So let's say I don't have two lines. Let's say I have a thousand lines. And I don't necessarily want to use read lines because maybe um, I, I don't know how many are in there and I only want to process them in chunks of 100. So I'm going to say for line in my file. So I can do a for loop over a file descriptor. I think it's kind of neat. The way I do that, I use the for uh, keyword. I line, line is just a variable. It's going to be your line of in, in the file. And then in tells Python what the for is going to work against. And it's my file. So I have a file descriptor, and I get to um, iterate over the, con the, the contents of that file using that descriptor. So if I print line, I'm going to print this as a file, and I'm going to go back up, I'm back to the line, and then I'm going to say with two lines. So that is another way to get at data, and it's the way that we do often when we're using large, large, large data sets. So, and then of course we close the file. Now, um, I think I already said this. The file descriptor is a, descriptor is a system resource. You got to manage your resources. Um, open gets the descriptor. Close returns the descriptor. Close also writes any changes that you made to a file. If you are doing file processing and you forget to close, Python doesn't actually necessarily write the contents to the file because Python actually keeps things in a buffer, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, when you close it, also the file object is no longer connected to the contents of the file, so the file descriptor can't get to anything. Um, writing to a file. So far we've read, now we're going to write. So what I said about closing is about to make a little more sense because Python doesn't actually write to the file directly, at least not in the beginning. So why? Why is there this buffer between um, what, my Python, what my Python script is doing and what the file actually is? The reason is because disk I.O. is the single most costly activity from a processing standpoint that you can do on a computer. And it just, it just is. That's the way it's always been. That's why a lot of things try to go to solid state drives 
because they're less expensive from a processing standpoint. But it's still the most expensive thing you can do. So to avoid having a lot of rights, a lot of programming languages, and Python is one of them, will set up a buffer in RAM. And then when that buffer gets close to filling up, then it'll flush it out to the draw, to the, op, the file in the system. And then it'll start over in the buffer, and then it'll flush it again. So that's why you don't want to do a disk write for every single line or every single character that's happening, because it's going to take a lot of time, and it's going to take a lot of processing. Um, so what do I have in the Python code? I have opened my file. In this case, my mode is W. So I'm going to write to the file. I'm just going to say file.write. Write Write is a new function, and it does just what it says it does. It's going to write data to the file. Now we're using the dot notation here. So the way you can read that is, hey, Python, write line one followed by a new line to my file. And, and so Python will simply put that in the buffer. And then it will do the same thing with line two. And then it will keep going until you're done. When you close, the one guarantee you have is, that it will write, is when you close. So always remember to close. If you're doing, uh, if you're doing your labs and things aren't working, double check that you've closed. Oh, yeah, one thing to note, if you use, if you open with write, as opposed to read write, with just a W, you will clear out any, and any previous contents of that file. It, they go away. Python will just create a new file in its place and it'll be empty. Remember that and be careful. To open a uh, file for reading, you have to use RW, read, write, write. And that's the way a lot of files are open. Um, how do you write to a file before close? Let's say I have, um, I'm creating tens of thousands of things. And, and those things have to be eventually written to a file. But I don't want to wait to the close because I don't want all this data building up in my program partially because what if my program crashes, and partially because I don't want to eat up a lot of RAM. Again, I only have so much RAM on my system. Well, what I can do is I can write to my big file. I'm going to write big file, and I'm going to keep writing it 100 times. When I'm done, or sorry, every tenth time I write to big file, I am going to flush the buffer. That function will flush the buffer for my file. Again, it uses the dot notation, and it says, hey, Python, anything that's in that buffer, force it onto disk for my file, to the my file descriptor. So that's what flush does. And it's a good thing to know about. So you have an opportunity to make sure that some of your data at least gets written before the close. However, you always still want to make sure you're going to close the file at the end. Um, so yeah, so that will actually flush it however many times. So closing flushes it and the flush function flushes it. Uh, flush writes any data in the buffer to the file, and if you're dealing with large file sets, you probably want to remember to use flush. So, now we have this new keyword called with. This is a way to, to uh, avoid using the close function, even though I've just spent the last half an hour saying, close your file, close your file, close your file with will automatically close the file for you. So the syntax here is you use the with keyword and the list, the, the with keyword tells Python, 
I'm going to loop over a file. I'm just, just understand that I am in this loop and it is going, I'm just going to loop over the file. So with is actually a special form of a loop used specifically for files only. After the with keyword comes the open statement. So I'm going to open something. And in this case, it's my text file.txt. And then there's the keyword as my file. Now, the word my file is just a variable. That's all it is. Could have named it Fred. Wouldn't have mattered. It just is a variable name that is um, only available in the local scope of this with statement. So that tells us that there is a local scope and that there has to be indentation happening because this is in fact a loop. So in my case, I'm just going to have line equal my file dot read line and then I'm going to print the line and I'm just going to keep going for as many lines as I have in my text file. Now the other thing I could do here is I could create a variable that's outside the width, so it's above the width, and maybe it's a list, or maybe it's a dictionary, because you might just be doing something with a dictionary to, and in your labs this week. And I can take the data from that, that I get in the with loop, and I can put it in that variable that's outside the local scope of the width. And then it will still be around in my data when the with loop ends, because with automatically closes it. When it is done with, with a block of code un, that is inside the local scope of this with statement, Python's automatically going to close. You don't have to call close on it. It's just going to do it, which is really nice and not always so nice if you're not capturing your data properly. Okay, and so then I'm going to print line two and the file will be closed automatically after it exits the with loop. So just remember that with is a special kind of a loop that's only over a file. And you need the file descriptor and a variable. So this is the syntax that you would use. Okay. With will process the file until it reaches the end of the file. So it won't stop unless you break out of it. Um, with will do the close for you, and with indicates a loop. So a real quick thing about working with operating systems, although we won't really have to do much, it's just important that what how Python makes this easy is Python neutralizes what the difference is. Because some operating ha system has, wait a minute, I shouldn't have done that. Let's go here. Some operating systems have the slash one way, some have the slash the other way, some have C colon blah, 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 Linux has slash home, blah, blah, blah. So what you do is Python will neutralize that difference for you. And if your script is written cor correctly, it can run on any operating system without having to make changes. Not said. Modules. Modules are so handy. Modules are libraries of code that are in Python. Somebody else has written them for you. In a lot of cases, we use the ones that Python has written. Python has written the OS module, and next week it's going to be, I think, regular expression. Um, there are thousands of modules. There are some by Python. There are some by third parties. And all of them interact with the operating system. Um, the module to interact with the operating system is called the OS module. And there are the links so you can understand modules and the OS module. Why do I care about the OS module? The OS, OS module, I'm going to mess that up so much tonight, um, will neutralize the path separators for you. And this matters if you have a fully qualified name. Well, what do I do? I import OS, import is a special keyword to Python, and it basically says, hey Python, I'm going to give you the name of a module, which is really the name of a file. 
and I want you to read in all of the code associated with that file and treat it like it's in my global scope. Just make it part of my program. That's what import does. And in this case, it's going to import the OS module. So it's import and then the name of the module. So it could be date time, it could be any kind of thing. You know, doing base 64 decoding, it could be base 64. So there's there's just massive amounts of modules out there. So that's simply the name of the module. And in this case, I'm going to say just as a quick example, file path is os.joins home else shannon module 6 lecture.key. And so what Python will do if it's Windows, it'll use the appropriate slash. And if it's Linux, it will use the appropriate slash. So that's all that does. But the, the real part, part here is you're going to use the import because you're going to need import this week. You're going to need import to do a CSV. Now we're going to do a very short foray into binary data. Um, not all data is human readable. In fact, most data that's stored on your computer is not human readable. It's encoded and or it's in some binary form. JPEG, GIF, movies, audio, Microsoft Office, none of those are human readable. Open your Microsoft Office document in a text editor. Try and read it. You can't. Um, and why do we do that? Well, binary data takes up less space, generally. And there's a quick way to deal with it, and that's B for bytes. So I can say my bytes equal B, and notice that B is outside the colon because that B is saying, hey, this is a binary data type, and the information is going to be bytes. And, yeah, B is the special nomenclature to treat that as a binary. And if I print my bytes, and if I type my bytes, it's going to print them and type them as bytes. We don't really need to use bytes, but I wanted to uh, I wanted to discuss it for just a short minute. So we do use comma separated value files this week. So a comma separated value file is just that it's your data and it's separated by commas. If you've ever saved if you've ever used Microsoft Excel and run save as CSV, that's a comma separated value file. Comma separated value files are often treated as matrices, which could mean that you're going to do multiple loops, multiple for loops. There is a special module called CSV, which can help process files in the CSV format. And this is all required for lab 7.8. And 7.8, and the other labs are, there's two labs this week, and they're long. So give yourself enough time. I know I'm telling you to give yourself enough time when you've got a project due next week, but try anyway. So if I want to do, if I want to deal with a CSV file, and to the right I have words.csv with cat in the hat, hat in the hand. Those are my words. All separated by commas. And I want to use this CSV module. I'm going to import CSV. And I'm going to create a word list. I'm just It's an empty list. It is a variable that is created outside of the local scope of the width operator so that I can actually use it when the width loop is done. Because remember, when the width is done, the file descriptor closes, and I can't get at the data anymore. So I have to store that data someplace that is in the global scope so that I can possibly use that data in a bit. So what do I do? The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open words.csv. In this case, I'm using the width keyword. I'm going to open it as words. So words is just a variable, and it's going to uh, handle each individual word. So here I'm using CSV reader. I'm saying content equal csv.reader because I'm getting csv.reader from the CSV module that I'm importing. And I'm going to give it my variable words. 
and a delimiter that's a comma. So, and by the way, the dot notation here is different than the dot notation when you're using a variable. CSV is a placeholder. It's telling Python, hey Python, the reader function doesn't live in this file that I'm working on right now. It lives in this other file called csv.py. So go to csv.py and get me the reader function. That's where you're going to find it. So the dot notation can be a little confusing when they use it this way, but this is how it's done. So that's how you read it from this perspective. CSV is not a variable in this perspective. CSV is a placeholder. So I'm going to read, and I'm going to give it my variable words, and then I'm going to tell it the delimiter is a comma, because even though it's comma-separated value, you can use other delimiters. And then I'm going to say for row in content, in case there are multiple lines in the file, because maybe I decided to put multiple lines in the file. Who knows? And I'm going to say for counter in range len row, for row of counter not in word list. <laughs> if row of counter not in list. Make sure the word is not already in the list. And then we're going to append it to my word list. So you'll see here, this looks a lot like dealing with a matrix. Kind of what we did for nested loops. Because it is pretty much exactly what we did for nested loops. Now we're not doing anything else with this, but in your lab, you're going to be doing more stuff with it. But this is the basic way to start for lab 7.9. You're going to import CSV. You're going to create some variable outside that with loop. Inside the with loop, you're going to get the contents of the, um, of the words in words.csv. And then I'm going to say for counter in range, len row, sorry, sorry, for row in content, in case there's multiple rows. Then for row in len row, so for every element in the row, if that element is not already in the word list, I'm going to add it to the word list. And then when I'm done, I'm just going to print word list. So list to a dictionary needed for 7.9. So the contents of dict.txt contain key value pairs. Unfortunately, the key is stored in a different line than the value. For example, the key is the first line in the file and the value is the second. Create a dictionary from the file and print it out in the format key value. So these are my contents. I did not make it a file here just because um, I, I just, yeah. I just didn't. So I'm going to create a dictionary. I'm going to do a four over the range of my contents. So you could imagine if this were a CSV file, you would get the contents just like we did in the previous slide. You would then loop over them. And instead of doing each individual element, you would do every other element. Now we know how to do every other element. I'm going to say if the counter plus 1 is less than the contents and the counter modulo 2 is 0, which means I'm on an even number, then I'm going to say if the contents of the counter is not in the dictionary, then I'm going to add to my dictionary the contents at the counter and then the contents at the counter plus 1. So I would get name in the dictionary. That would be my first contents. And then I get Lisa as my contents of counter plus one. I'd loop around again. I'd get answer. And then that would be my uh, contents at counter because I'd incremented. And then I have contents of counter plus one. So I would roll through just like that. And then I would look at it and I would say for each key in the dictionary, I'm going to print out uh, and actually... I think that that range needs to have a 2 at the end. My apologies. So, and then I'm just going to roll through it, and I'm going to print it. 
So this is similar to what you're going to have to do for 7.9. 7.9 is a long, long lab, and we're going to go over it in just a minute. Um, so we're going to use a list. Sorry, let me go back and see if there's anything else on here. No, there wasn't. Okay, so word frequencies. This is 7.8, and this is where you're going to have your CSV file. So you're going to have some file that's going to be input. Cybooks is going to give you the name. You're going to have a word list, which is going to be empty. You're going to open the CSV file for reading. This is a really good place to use that with statement, those two lines in the box. So, and as long as there are more lines in the CSV file, you're going to set a variable called user file equal to the results of the CSV reader, just like we had in that other slide. So, and it's for row, in, for each row in user file, for index and the length of the row. Um, if the row at index is not in the word list, output the value of the row at the index and the count, and then append it. So this is what you have to do for 7.8, and it's very much like that so slide we looked at. 7.9 is a big one, and and it's almost like a separate project. So I apologize that it comes in 7. Okay. So what we have to do here is we're actually having to take a file read it in, modify it, write it out, read that in, and modify it out, and write it out again. Um, and so this is about creating a couple of different, it's using the same data in a couple of different formats of the files. So we've got some variables we have to create before we do anything else. We're going to have, somebody's going to input the file name, Zybooks will, um, and then we're going to have we're going to set the user file e equal to the file descriptor, the opened file. And then we're going to set output list to lines in user file. One minute. We're going to create an empty dictionary for my dict. We're going to have a show list, which is an empty list, and a show list split, which is also an empty list. So now, for index in length out of list. What are we going to do? Well, the first part is we're going to basically have some temporary list that we're keeping in that we're going to use to store temporary data. So we're going to set list object equal to the output at the index where the new line has been removed. So we're going to have to make sure we remove the new line. And then we're going to say if index plus one is less than the length of the output list, and index modulo 2 is equal to 0, so we are checking every other element. We're going to convert the list object here. Whoops, sorry. Shouldn't have done that. We're going to create this list object here, and we're going to send it to an integer. And then we're going to say, if the list object is in the dictionary, remove new line from output list, at index one and then append it to the dictionary. So we're creating a dictionary element here. Otherwise, could you remember what's doing that compute? Yeah, who's doing that? Uh thank you, Lewis. Could you please move? No, everybody's muted. Thank you very much. Um, otherwise, if it's not in the dictionary, we're going to add it to the dictionary. So we're either going to change the value or we're going to add it to the dictionary. That's part one. Part two is I'm going to, I've got to sort it by the keys, which is the years, 
for the least amount of years to the greatest. So it's going to be smallest to greatest. So I'm going to sort the dictionary and I'm going to use the sorted function from 6.9. Don't try and sort it on your own. Use what Python gives you. Okay? And then set my dict sorted by keys to a new dictionary populated with sorted my dict. So you're going to sort it. And when you sort it, you're going to set it into a variable called sorted my dict. And then you're going to have my dict sorted by keys to a new dictionary populated with that. And several approaches to create a dictionary on the third bullet for 6.14 on dictionaries. You should look at that. All right, we're going to change from a dictionary to a list now. So it's for X in keys of my dictionary of keys append to um, show list. So I'm going to create a list of keys. And I haven't even gotten to writing out my files yet. And then I'm going to split the list of lists into a single list. So I'm now going to go through show list and I'm going to append it to show list dot split. So we're going to add the elements to a list. And I'm going to sort the list and the output using the sort function or the sorted function. Yes, there is a third part to this. And now I'm going to open output keys for writing. And then I'm going to have this for value key value in the dictionary of sorted keys, I'm going to convert the key to a string. I'm going to write the key plus colon to the file. And then for item in value, so you're just going to do colon minus one, which is everything, common slicing operation. Write the item plus semicolon to the file. So F is the file here. And then we're going to write value minus one to file and write a new line to the file. So we have to write all of this stuff into the file. And then we're going to close the file, which is actually going to write it. And now we're going to set F2, which is just another variable, to output, file, output titles.txt. And so for that, I now want to just write the titles. And all I'm going to do for that is I'm going to write the item from the show list split to F2 followed by a new line. Got to make sure I put the new lines there. And then I'm going to close F2. 7.9 is a long lab. Give yourself time. And go back and use the slides that we've talked about for just a few minutes to use to help you with that. Okay? Um, and also time box it. You will, um, and I'm sure some professors don't like when I say this, but you, your uh, project is worth 100 points. This individual lab, if you, if you didn't do anything on it at all, is only worth half of 35, which is 17.5. So if it's a choice between getting your project done and getting the most points out of your project as opposed to getting this lab done, you might want to take a little less time on the lab and a little more time on your project. So just a thought. So you want to always do that cost-benefit analysis because unless you finish your lab, sorry, your project, it's going to be, you know, there's a lot to do. So I know I just gave you a lot of information. Does anyone have any questions? Do you have any questions about the project? Is there anything you guys want to go over? Okay. Going once. Going twice. Okay, good luck on your projects, everyone. I should have this up tomorrow on the uh, on the YouTube site, and if you're in my class, reach out to me if you have any questions, or if you're struggling with 
your project, send me an email with the Python script and let me know what problems you're having and I'll see if I can get you moving. So good night everyone and um, I will see you next week. And by the way, you're doing great. You all are doing great. Next week is week eight and you guys are doing spectacular. You've made it this far and that's a long way. Good night all.